Can you hear me? Now. Now. Okay, this needs to be a bit louder. No, the mic has to be closed. The mic has to be closed, okay. All right. Um, I would like the speakers for the first session to play tally and come up and say here, if they might. And uh, I'd like to say welcome to all of you and introduce our Dean of Social Sciences, who is going to give us um, an introduction, a welcome, a welcoming introduction. Welcome. So we're very pleased to have Dean Sheldon Kamenyeki uh, coming to talk with us. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out. I know um, this is a very busy time for those of you who are UCSC and are maybe taking classes. Very busy time in the quarter, and um, to take a Saturday morning, a Saturday, whole, almost a whole day for, um, for the conference is terrific. Uh, I think that underscores the importance that so many of you feel about the issue, and particularly not only climate change specifically, but more generally its relationship to development and other things that it impinges upon. Uh, it is quite, we cannot. Uh, approach it without being interdisciplinary. I was very pleased to see the level of interdisciplinarity in, in the conference and the speakers. Um, and uh, Ben, and particularly Costanza, I understand, has done uh, Yeoman's work in trying to pull it all together. It's just not easy to do, and it takes planning and, and navigating around the university um, administration and policies and what else have you and want to know about what else you've done. Uh, but it's a great group to have this meeting too. It's, it's big enough to hold a large number of people, but not so big that you can't have some really good discussions. Um, so um, welcome. Uh, for those of you who have not been to UCSC, uh, it's a beautiful campus. It's a terrific place, of course, to have a conference like this. Uh, I do hope we can continue this uh, these meetings because uh, climate change is, of course, the, the probably the, the major environmental issue facing us in this new century. And it's also the most challenging, uh, primarily given the, um, the, the uh, interest groups that are involved that are pushing um, any kind of uh, blocking of, of any kind of government uh, action on climate change, not only in the US, but internationally as well. And they're very, very powerful interest groups. We are clearly swimming uh, up the river at, at a tough current but we've got to keep swimming because uh, every every time, if it's not too late already, uh, the effects are going to already be felt negatively if we're not feeling them already. Uh, but uh, as time goes on, every day that goes by, every week, every month, every year, and not controlling greenhouse gases makes it so much more difficult uh, later on to uh, do something about this issue and, and, and effectively address it. And um, I just hope that, uh, I know Americans are reactive uh, to the issue, uh, to the problem of climate change. I do hope that it doesn't go so far so that we wait until the, uh, the, until the American public wakes up and realizes, oh my, oh my God, we do really have a problem. The science is there, it's clear. Uh, it could be too late by then because of the accumulation of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and our inability to remove them. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, it's a really vexing problem. So I'm really glad that you're interested in it, and I hope that you have a terrific conference today. And welcome to UCSC. Thank you very much, Sheldon. I should hand over to the, uh, whose chair is this? I'm <laughs> sorry. Jeff, okay, Jeff, I'm sorry. Good morning, everyone. I thought I would, uh, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I just want to thank the Teachers Center for Global, International, and Regional Studies, so it's <coughs> um, Science and Justice Working Group, the Interdisciplinary Development Working Group, and the Departments of Sociology and Environmental Studies. Everyone has graciously agreed to support and organize the event. Thanks also to our, our supporters and, or, and yeoman organizers, so to speak. So our keynote speaker this morning is Professor Hallie Aiken. Professor Aiken is currently a senior sustainability scientist at the Global Institute of Sustainability and an associate professor in the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. 
Prior to moving to the School of Sustainability, Professor Aiken was a faculty member in the Department of Geography at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And sometime before that, I think there were immediately before that, was a postdoctoral fellow at the U.S. Mexican Study Center at the University of California at San Diego. She was also served as a fellow at the Tinville Center for Climate Change Research in East Anglia, the Center for Atmospheric Sciences in Mexico City, and the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford University. Professor Aiken has also extensively worked with national and international development agencies such as the World Bank and USAID. Professor Aiken's recent research has been focused on themes related to agricultural change, rural vulnerability, hazards and risks mitigation, and adaptation and social and ecological resilience across Latin America. Her recent research projects include managing biodiversity under climate change, conservation planning and enhancing capacities in Mexico, drought vulnerability in Brazil, and advancing sustainability science in the US and Mexico. She's also worked on uh, questions related to adaptation strategies and adaptive capacity lessons from the coffee crisis in both Mexico and across the Pacific Rim. So her work has been supported by the National Science Foundation's Human Systems Dynamics Program, the Global Environmental Facility, and the United Nations Environmental Program, as well as the International Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. Professor Aiken is the author of numerous articles and manuscripts, as well as a recent book published by the University of Arizona Press, Weathering Risk in Rural Mexico, Climate, Economic, and Institutional Change. We very much appreciate her uh, kindly agreeing to join us this morning, quite early this morning, to uh, discuss development in light of climate change. And she's agreed to discuss uh, her lecture titled as Trade-offs and Synergies of Development and Climate Change. So please welcome me and, and please join me in welcoming her this morning. Sustainable futures. 
In essence, uh, this morning I'd like to emphasize the following points, and I hope that this might engender some debate, and I think it fits to some extent with what is on the agenda today. Um, so, and I wanted to bring them up first, in case I don't have time and I don't get to them later on. So first, I think there's a strong basis for synergy. I think adaptation policy and the efforts to enhance uh, sustainable development are both about the constraints and flexibility of choice. Although perhaps the normative goals associated with development and adaptation to climate change are distinct, and perhaps neither are embracing sufficiently the need for transformative structural change. Second, I think we all recognize that choices are not made in a vacuum. We need to be far more cognizant, cogn cognizant over how decisions made today at high levels about development priorities will circumscribe, circumscribe the choices in the future. Just as we need to understand how key decisions in the past that are now embedded in the policies and institutions that we have today are circumscribing uh, the choices that, and the flexibility, flexibility of choices today and the present. So there's a historical legacy that we need to confront, and we need to understand what our responsibility is today in creating those legacies that will be apparent in the future. And third, there are clear trade-offs and tensions, as well as synergies, between building capacities for human development and social transformation, and building capacities for managing the emerging risks associated with climate change. And if we're going to find pathways to more sustainable futures, we need to address these tensions directly. So I feel that adaptation is a fruitful lens through which we can explore these synergies and tensions between climate change and development. While vulnerability tends to be a label associated with victimization and marginalization and connotations of powerlessness, adaptation really focuses on decision making, as this definition from my colleague Don uh, and his uh, work uh, has emphasized. Adaptation focuses on agency and the purpose of actors as they, uh, as they, they navigate new combinations of stressors and emerging opportunities. As scholars, we tend to focus on these choice sets when we think about ad adaptation. What is the range of opportunities and choices that particular vulnerability po vulnerable populations have in terms of access to resources, their entitlements, their rights, uh, their endowments? And the uh, aim of adaptation thus is to kind of expand that flexibility of choice as we confront uh, new opportunities and stressors. This obviously has very much uh, some strong synergies with uh, work and development, uh, which according to Amar just said, is also about the process of expanding the real freedoms that people have, essentially creating conditions in which people have the freedom to choose among alternative pathways to livelihood, stability, and to meet welfare goals. And this, this synergy, this complementarity, is obviously uh, something that has been, uh, in a sense, designed. A lot of the social vulnerability literature has been built on the entitlement framework of Amar uh, just we also know, however, that addressing individual agency is not enough. As Amartya Sen eloquently argues, it is important to give simultaneous recognition to the centrality of individual freedom and to the force of social influences on the extent and reaches of individual freedoms. So likewise, in adaptations, we need to consider the broader context in which choice is exercised. And this is what I'm calling the range of choice. The full spectrum of ideas, knowledge, innovations, and resources available to a society at any moment in time for adaptation. And so this figure attempts to illustrate how over time, in an ideal world, we're trying, when we think about kind of what we mean by adaptation, is to expand that full range of choice, just as we're expanding the choice sets, that <coughs> interior circle there, of particular vulnerable actors. And of course, this range of choice is part in large part, a, a product of historical legacy. It is the product of ideas, values, priorities, and desires that were set in motion some time ago by actors with power and influence who have shaped social interaction, expectations, and indeed transformed landscapes, the biophysical landscape, uh, and thus define the options that we have available to us today. It becomes, this range of choice becomes part of our vocabulary, it defines how we think about the world, defines what we think is progress, what is desirable, and thus, it blinds us potentially to alternatives as we move forward thinking about a future with much greater uh, uncertainties. Where the processes that are driving that range of choice for society as a whole works against the needs, the values, the priorities of vulnerable actors and communities, we might have conditions of friction. 
and high potential for maladaptation. And here, for example, we might situate Siri Erickson's and Jeremy Lin's work on the politics of adaptation in rural Kenya. Um, they argue that adaptation is fundamentally a political process where a long-standing bias against pastoralism in Kenya has led to an undermining of the kind of social capital and local institutions and pastoral communities for dealing with risk, and thus is undermining the capacities of those populations to exercise their ability to manage risk effectively. They argue that it's not wealth or assets per se that matter when we think about adaptive capacity, but rather the ability of populations to link their interests and needs to an institutional process through political ties and influence. In other words, they're arguing that political capital is actually one of the more fundamental attributes of adaptive capacity in the current era. While we tend to focus on cases like that, where we have these kind of frictions between the broader trajectory of development or of, uh, of society and the needs of local populations, there are also cases of high synergies. And if for here, for example, we might situate some of the work I've been doing recently in northern Mexico in the state of Sinaloa. And there we've documented how farmers have been very effective in organizing themselves to take advantage of a window of opportunity uh, that was presented to them in the neoliberal reforms of the 1990s. They have been able to actually uh, not only to be primary beneficiaries of those reforms, but actually use that beneficiary relationship to shape national policy. And so their choice sets have consequently expanded. They have privileged access to subsidized insurance, credit, emergency compensation should their harvest fail. Nevertheless, this type of synergistic relationship is not always a positive thing. Uh, it can reinforce the trajectory of development to the point that vulnerabilities that are particularly acute in a local area then have the capacity to kind of scale up and create systemic uh, weaknesses. And this is actually was very apparent in 2011 when Sinaloa suffered a devastating frost, had natural, national perturbations in the base market, uh, and, and caused the national government to outlay significant uh, national resources to resuscitate the state's agricultural sector. It is, there's been very little discussion in Mexico whether this concentration of production and federal resources in one particular sector, one particular state, um, is beneficial for, for national uh, food system resilience. <coughs> While most would agree that trying to find synergies between development and adaptation goals would be desirable, the complexity and cost of developing a policy that does this is obviously uh, difficult, uh, particularly for governments who have to make hard choices about where to allocate resources. And my colleagues, Don uh, Nelson and Mary Carmen, and I have been proposing that in order to find this ideal synergies, or, or at least better conditions in which these synergies can take place, we might, it might be helpful to divide our, or disaggregate our idea of, of capacity into two categories. One are what we might call generic capacities, and these are the capacities that are most associated with kind of sustainable development uh, generally, education, health, welfare, uh, wealth, uh, accumulation, livelihood stability, and specific capacities, which are those that are designed for uh, to encourage or enable populations to deal with specific risks like drought or uh, flood risks, uh, which might be involved insurance, infrastructure investments, uh, the adoption of technologies that are designed to specifically address particular climatic risks. And so, if we can think of these in a matrix, here in this figure, the lower left. Uh, quadrant would be defined by populations or places that might be uh, in classic poverty traps. These are, these are places where there's chronic stress, repeated severe welfare crises, crises, populations who are lacking sufficient capital and assets to offset the cost of investing in adaptation, <coughs> who are living in very uh, unstable or grossly inadequate situations of governance. Uh, these are populations who will not be able to invest in any idea of uh, climate change. Instead, they are in a constant mode of coping in order to address the critical survival concerns of their immediate environment. We can imagine where these places are, uh, places where there's violent political conflict, very difficult uh, uh, conditions that are eroding the basic social fabric of communities, so that the capacity to just organize collectively is, isn't there. Uh, and it's doubtful in this, in this populations in this quadrant that any 
uh, increase in specific capacity will occur without a, a preceding in investment in the building of some threshold of generic capacity. In the lower right corner, we might have what we call Faustian bargain uh, populations, households who are probably are very familiar, uh, or populations very familiar to many of you who work in adaptation around the world, whether in the Arctic Circle or the Sahel or the high tropics. These are populations that have high specific risk management capacities. Frequent exposure to climate variability has led these populations over time to develop relatively sophisti sophisticated local institutions to manage environmental risk, and typically involving risk pooling behavior, economic diversification, production diversification, uh, the pursuit of risk adverse livelihood strategies. However, we also know that in many cases, these strategies and these populations are not living in conditions of hot, what we might call high generic capacity. Um, their efforts to ensure their day-to-day -day consumption needs are met has not produced longer-term significant welfare improvements. And thus, we might say that their generic capacity is low. The low levels of generic capacity are not, however, a product necessarily of those risk management strategies, but rather the institutional environments in which they're operating. And uh, over the last several decades, we know that the dom dominant mode of economic policy in many places has tended to emphasize advantages of economic specialization and relatively narrow definitions of production efficiency. And in such context, these risk management strategies are not likely to be rewarded. Um, and so that there is this idea of this Faustian bargain uh, that is prevalent in these, in these contexts. And then in the upper left quadrant, we might find individual actors with high education levels, relatively high wealth, and human welfare. However, as individuals, they may be poorly prepared to autonomously cope with risk and change. Recent climate extremes in many parts of the industrialized world uh, have illustrated this. We can think of the heat wave of 2003 in France, Katrina, where you have populations that have trusted in public institutions to defend them against unprecedented uh, uh, environmental change and crises and have, have been unable to find or have had to struggle to organize their autonomous capacities to cope when those institutional institutions have failed them. And in some cases, they may be living in contexts that are essentially not at, at high risk from environmental change and so as yet have not had to develop those capacities. In other cases, it may be that a variety of public and private institutions, technology, and infrastructure have put, made it such that their day-to-day -day risks are not borne as much locally by individuals, but more uh, through uh, formal institutional arrangements that are spreading that risk across a broader population, and perhaps even deferring that or externalizing that risk internationally. Um, and so the reliance on these institutional arrangements has provided a kind of bubble in which they can, if populations can pursue uh, strategies that allow them financial, material, uh, capital accumulation, can acquire credit and insurance, and allow them to make strategic future-oriented investments that are building that generic capacity. Yet there is also a possibility that they may be, these populations may become complacent and not willing to kind of embrace the new threats or uh, emergent opportunities posed by the kind of unprecedented nature of change that we're now, now dealing with. And the fact that these populations often, because of their high generic capacity, have disproportionate influence on that range of choice, that has an effect systemically in terms of what types of options are available, what is the flexibility of choice for other populations elsewhere. Um, so it's, it's not a trivial uh, issue. And finally, in the upper right, quadrant, we have high individual specific risk management capacities with high generic capacities. And this is the conceptually ideal domain, what we might call sustainable adaptation, or I think Maria Carmen is talking about in terms of adaptive development. Um, here we recognize that effective risk management is not likely to be enough. The nature of our coupled, highly integrated global system means that populations of the world are going to have to deal with considerable uncertainty in the coming decades. There's not going to be one actor, organization, or institution that's going to be able to manage that risk effectively. And we're going to need complex governance arrangements to help facilitate uh, moving forward and kind of transforming society in this context. And how, the, so the big question is how do we develop this uh, capacity for transformation? And so we need uh, institutions and governance that permits the innovation at the local, permits 
a local response to the stressors that are experienced, to have individuals and communities dealing directly with that change and innovating in response, while also guaranteeing and maintaining that a context in which those generic capacities are also, also built. And that the structural determinants of vulnerability are consistently uh, attended to. So if we think about moving forward here, how do we move to, if, that, if we can agree that that may be some sort of desirable quadrant to be in, how do we move into that, that position? And so one of the uh, ways that we're conceiving is kind of mapping on different case studies that we've been looking at into this uh, quadrant and recognizing that the pathways of any particular place or population towards that upper uh, right quadrant um, will be distinct according to initial conditions. And we also don't yet know what is that ideal combination of specific and generic capacities that will produce the appropriate synergies to get uh, to move us forward. For example, in, in the case of uh, conditions of poverty traps, we can think of the Northeast Brazil case, which I don't know if many of you are familiar with it, chronic droughts that have had historically devastating consequences in the region, famine, hunger, migration, um, and the response to that condition has often been uh, in a very clientelistic mode, uh, which has not tended to build local capacities for dealing with, with risk, and has created kind of an un unsustainable and very negative uh, reinforcement of vulnerability in the region. What appears to be making the difference, and this is the subject of ongoing research with Don and uh, Mary Carmen, is pensions that have been uh, provided in the rural development uh, uh, policy. This is not a specific uh, uh, program to address drought specifically. It's about human welfare. It's about recognizing that the elderly uh, need uh, an additional source of income, um, and that the provisioning of pensions to rural households appears now to have opened all sorts of ways for these households now to deal with emergent environmental change. And in fact, this latest, uh, what we're studying now, is how this latest drought, the 2012 drought, which has been compared to the major drought in the 1950s, has been managed very distinctly by local populations because of the flexibility that their enhanced generic capacity has provided them. We can also think uh, in some of the work that I've been doing in Mexico where it's very well recognized the diversity of strategies and the effectiveness of strategies of smallholder maize producers uh, in dealing with environmental change. The seed varieties, the modes of managing their landscapes and their production practices, their local economy and livelihoods, but very seldom have those strategies been, strategies been uh, rewarded in national policy. Just last year, a new policy has been put into place. We have yet to see really how this will take place on the landscape and what the implications are, but it has, it's worth considering in, the, in light of this, this uh, framework. And that's a policy called Masagro, in which smallholder farmers, uh, maize farmers are being, and their strategies are being encouraged, in a sense, uh, subsidized or supported uh, in national policy as part of a national agenda for climate change adaptation. Um, and so we don't know yet what the implications will be. This is a policy as a result of a, a new collaboration between CIMIT, the Center for Wheat and Maize uh, Research in Mexico, uh, and the Mexican government. But the idea is potentially, potentially, it could help mobilize those risk management strategies to build uh, more generic capacity among smallholder populations. And then another project that I'm working on now uh, in central Arizona uh, with irrigated farmers. And here we have a case where farmers have uh, quite, uh, comparatively, uh, quite good uh, conditions for their pursuit of their production practices. Not only are commodity prices very high at the moment, but farmers have established since the 1980s significant buffers against environmental risk. They have multiple sources of water, very secure water rights. Their land prices, should urban encroachments force them to sell, um, are likely to be very profitable, result in very profitable transactions for them. Nevertheless, in central Arizona, we are now concerned with emergent knowledge about the future of the Colorado River uh, under climate change uh, scenarios that central Arizona will not have the, the type of flexibility of water that we've enjoyed uh, over the last uh, 100 years or so. And this means that all players, if they're going to have a future in this region, are going to have to make adjustments. Agriculture constitutes about 30 to 70% of water use in, in central Arizona around Phoenix. 
Yet farmers have very little incentive to change anything about their production practices. So how in this context do we communicate environmental risks to a population to bring them into the process of thinking more strategically and collectively about a more sustainable future for the central Arizona uh, area. And this may mean dismantling some of the protections that are currently in place for that population in order to have them engage more uh, proactively in thinking about uh, some of the future scenarios for, for the region. So I want to conclude uh, here with just a few few thoughts uh, about, this is a kind of an agenda for myself, um, but it may be useful in, in the context of this meeting. So while we're thinking about climate change adaptation and human development as essentially about developing capacities for agency and flexibility and choice and opportunity, we need to be thinking about the potential uh, uh, tensions that may emerge between these uh, two domains of, of public policy and investment. And one way to go about this, thinking about the generic and specific capacities, and I'm not sure we're exploring this. I'd love to get some feedback whether this is a useful heuristic or not uh, in thinking about these, these issues. But it would, it's helpful for me to think about the thresholds at which there may be positive and synergistic feedbacks between these two uh, capacities and their development. And then I think, of course, there needs to be more attention to these ultimate drivers that shape the range of choice. And this is very difficult. We have to be thinking very critically about not only about the legacies of those factors in, in, in the kind of social structures and the landscapes and the worldviews that we're dealing with today, but how the decisions that we're making today about the trajectory of development is going to be shaping choices uh, in, in the decades to come. And this means reconsidering the role of governance and institutions in capacity building, uh, in specifically in recognition of the need for transformational change. And here what I mean is that we need to be thinking about the structural causes of vulnerability, transforming that rather than dealing with the symptoms, and also thinking about the potential that as a society we're going to be dealing with the rate, pace, and integration of change in the future and uncertainties. And this is not just about climate change, it's about globalization, it's about the, the type of potential for surprise in all sorts of domains in which climate will be one factor uh, in that process. And are we ready, are we prepared to be in that context to manage that uncertainty? And so what I'd like to argue is that we're not, if we are to achieve these synergies, um, between development objectives and climate change adaptation, we need to recognize that sustainable adaptation is not about adaptations that are sustained through time, nor is it about adaptations that sustain the current state, which is undeniably unsatisfactory for the many uh, of the world's population. Sustainable adaptations must be fundamentally transformative in a world that is characterized by unprecedented uncertainty and unknowns rather than manageable and measurable risk. So I thought I'd probably mention briefly the sort of structure of the rest of the session. I didn't actually mention that earlier. Uh, what we had intended to do for this session was for, to have a primary discussion, a few moments of comments as a uh, discussion that we be, and then moving on to questions. We wanted to make sure we had time for other for participation as opposed to everything else. We have until about a quarter after. Any time um, that I actually been trying to keep an eye on my on my watch, but I wanted before I started the discussion, I just wanted to remind everyone and to mention that Professor Aiken has very gradually or very generously agreed to give another lecture for us on Monday in Department of Environmental Studies um, on in our colloquium series entitled "Poverty Policy and Preferences: The Resilience of the Mexican Bay System," and that would be from 12:30 to. 140 interdisciplinary <coughs> sciences building, uh, 221. So I just thought I'd point that out. So we'll have more opportunities, a whole weekend of conversations, if, if you will. Well, when I began to organize my remarks as a discussion, I realized that 
I'm serving as a discussant of one for a lecture of one in the very first session of our day-long meetings. That posed some significant challenges to me uh, because usually discussants provide some sort of synthetic commentary across more than one presentation and usually with the idea of generating a few central propositions for further discussion. Well, because I feel slightly synthetically challenged at this juncture in our meeting, I thought perhaps I'd adopt a slightly broader uh, role as discussant and would like to therefore pursue several combined objectives in my, in my comments. Uh, first, first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about the central themes of the lecture with the hopes that I might highlight some key issues and perhaps contextualize them briefly or at least provide another example, I suppose, or two. Um, that relates to broader discussions in development and climate change that I think why we're all here to discuss. And the second was probably, is my second objective, is to provide at least a few tentative remarks that will possibly highlight future questions and issues that will come up for the rest of today's session, a way of sort of pointing off to the, to the future. Well, I'd like to begin with sort of a, a brief discursus or divergence that draws upon recent descriptions of what I like to call unfolding hydrometeorological events in the United States, particularly near the Atlantic coast and the Atlantic Ocean. Well, while it's often stated that California's four seasons include earthquake, fire, flood, and drought, pause for dramatic laugh, um, <laughs> There have been very few instances of tropical cyclones that have affected the state, although there are a few, and there are some historical incidents that are uh, quite interesting. Well, currently in the rest of the United States, at least the eastern seaboard and the southern seaboard, this is very much not the case. This is the season of hurricanes, and there have currently a storm of tremendous proportions is, is forming that will likely affect the entire northeastern seaboard. I'm sure you've all been paying attention to it. Um, I don't follow sports, I follow things like hurricanes to be my, my hobby. Well, as the storm, which has turned into Hurricane Sandy very quickly, intensified and moved across the Caribbean Basin earlier this week, climate modelers, forecasters, and climate specialists began to realize that something without precedent seemed to be taking place. So, in the words of the National Weather Service, they, they, they dubbed this particular event very interesting name, which I'm sure you've heard. Um, they stated that the circulation associated with Hurricane Sandy will pass close enough to an amplifying polar trough over the eastern United States to become incorporated into a hybrid vortex over the northeastern Atlantic states. Once the combined gyre materializes, it should settle back toward the interior through Halloween, inviting a ghoulish nickname along the lines of Frankenstorm. An allusion to Mary Shelley's gothic creature of synthesized elements. That's actually from the National Weather Service. Um, <laughs> Frankenstorm, or Bride of Frankenstorm, which depends on that. There was, there, CNN apparently disagrees with this, but I thought that I would use this as an example, an intended example, and one that has tremendous possible consequences, to discuss a little bit in the sort of larger context of the issues of this meeting, as well as some of the themes of, of Professor Aiken's talk. First of all, I think that it raises one important question. Does Hurricane Sandy and all of the other future storms to come, as well as one might suggest broader climate change, does it present us with the challenge of a no analog future? And this is something that I often refer to and discuss with my other, my interdisciplinary colleagues and when we work in the field, this idea that there is a future that is not going to be the same as the past. And development very much, as we all know, for many decades was predicated on the notion of progress towards a goal that could be usually defined in some sort of rational enlightenment. Then it came a huge critique later, those sorts of questions. Well, the climate change component seems pretty obvious. The Atlantic shore, near shore water is about seven degrees above normal. Uh, fall takes place on average in the United States 10 days later than in the past. Uh, there's great instability in the polar vortex, primarily because of rapidly diminishing polar ice. Uh, and all of these shifting climatic processes will be soon be converging into this Frankenstorm, which forecasters and modelers have repeatedly mentioned in the past several days that they have never seen anything like this before. Their models did not account for it, they had never anticipated it, and frankly were caught as surprised as everyone else. 
So I think this raises very important questions about what sort of development can we consider when there are new analogs or examples in the future? Would we depend on past or recent historical trajectories? How do we work in local context when both climatic and social variables are all shifting at the same time? And I think that from all of our work, that the great uncertainty and tremendous concern for the future is something that we've all seen. Um, at least I've seen the Andes, and I'm sure you've seen in your work as well, with local communities who have no idea what's going on, and that their in sense of the world changing is, is deeply challenged. It also presents some significant challenges for identifying future pathways to sustainability. Are they hidden, obscure, partially recognizable? Uh, how wide might they be? I like to use the sort of road less traveled sort of idea. Well, there also are some question about the goals of these pathways. Is it capacity or resi and resilience, or is it just, as we all fear, crisis management? Will we lurch from Frankenstorm to snow apocalypse to Nora Kane? These are all words you know, to the snowmageddon of the future. Um, and what kind of development, funding, and efforts will be dedicated to just dealing with this sort of problems as we face them on an immediate basis? Well, I think most of us have noticed that many of the development funding today has been refashioned, recast, and redirected towards crisis management, as opposed to actually talking about local capacity adaptation and resilience, which I think we're particularly interested in today, and I would absolutely agree uh, with the current discussion. So in the case of this week, is it the 60 million people in front of the Frankenstorm who are likely to be affected, and the infrastructure, the fact that the governor of Connecticut said plan on being without power for at least a month, right up front. They already declared states of emergency all over the, 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 the uh, various states. Well, is this the case then? What about USAID and the rest of our major development institutions? What, what, what sort of changes do we expect to see there? Well, two more examples, and I'll move on because I want to make sure we have time. Because I think that Hurricane Sandy also provides a very useful example for Frankenstorm Sandy is uh, the ways in which climate change is accelerating complex and codependent social and ecological systems across the planet. Right? So we've seen this fundamental acceleration and intensification of amplitudes. Um, this is very similar to the, to the framework that Professor Aiken talked about as well. So what about other questions then when we think about feedbacks and, and complicated change? What about nonlinear feedbacks that don't necessarily have trajectories that look like arrows, but may look like complicated feedback loops having a hurricane turn to the left, so to speak, or at least to the west, is something that's almost unprecedented. You know? That's why most of the models never were able to accommodate them. This also includes <coughs> frictions and synergies and ranges that were also discussed in sort of this conversation. How can we build or conceive of frameworks that might accommodate some of those changes? Because I can tell right now, this is for me, I'm not sure I'm able to conceive of nonlinear change. I've, I've often felt that perhaps my students that I work with all the time can, but I've been too, you know, too old perhaps, or something maybe that jolt the old brain. But, um, and then what, what kind of scalability of vulnerability and what kinds of margins might we deal with if we think of these complex frameworks? Because I suspect that today's conversation will also be a conversation about social and ecologi ecological frameworks, the SES versus sort of some of the political economy of development conversations. And what are those useful interfaces? Because I expect that we'll all be talking about them. Well, the other one then is this, my question about the arrow of time or the temporal dilemmas related to climate change. So sustainability discussions in general, as well as some of the climate change and development uh, debates, are rightly addressing longer time periods. The idea of focusing on perhaps at least maybe one generation, seven generations might be too much to ask at some point. But what about also these questions of vectors, trajectories, and path dependency? All of those things that are conditioned as we move across this time, or this arrow of time. And I mostly wanted to, to point out that what about the past time? Right? Those historical trajectories that are also equally important because they highlight and evolve questions of political economy, inequality, environmental justice, and also pretty much, I think, ca capture or characterize where the current negotiations over international climate change are actually located today. The idea that inequality has frozen most of the international courts because of many countries arguing 
we did not create this problem, and therefore the historical injustices of, of emissions uh, tyrannies, I suppose, are, are, are very much on the table today. So I wanted to point out that um, we're, in order to avoid the fallacy and bargain, what might need to be recognized in, in the past. And then finally, as we think about these future trajectories and factors about them, I, I like to point out the, the, some of the bigger questions about the agentless models or some form of agent structure assemblage that we might think about in the future. Uh, the modelers from Hurricane Sandy, I've enjoyed reading there. I've never thought of this before. Our models have no way of accommodating all these various energies. The surprise on their face as they point and at all their really fancy graphics now. And one of the things that I've actually realized over the past decade of working with interdisciplinary teams is that oftentimes our regional models or even our super computer powered 20 kilometers or seven kilometers square uh, models have really no realistic assessment of human behavior in them. I call them agentless models because rational actors and assume away so much in those models, or the rational actor models, or even the prisoner dilemma models, that the conceptual remedies seem very challenging. And I'd just like to point out that that's something I think is very important for right now. Is, is there a realistic way of accommodating these synergies between social and ecological systems and the political economy of development and climate change? So that's actually what I wanted to leave us off with is sort of, I think, some of the themes you might talk about today. And then just open it up for questions uh, for our, our lecture.
might actually be a sort of negative, or might have a negative feedback effect on both generic and specific capacity in, in terms of a rigid allocation system. Certainly for downstream users, it seems like it already is probably having an effect. Well, definitely. I mean, this, this is a fascinating case for me. It's one of the few places I've worked in U.S. context, and, and one of the, the, the interesting issues is that the farmers themselves, if you were just looking at the vulnerability of these farms, they're not vulnerable. They have all the water that they could possibly use now, more than they can use. They're actually storing water for municipalities at this point. Um, and if things get tough, they have all the rights to sell it off and will probably come away pretty well and can relocate or retire or move to California. <laughs> to your challenges, <laughs> but, but the question that we're dealing with is, is their participation beneficial in a kind of more systemic sense? Does, does the kind of coupled rural urban context in central Arizona potentially benefit for the continued, from the continued presence of agricultural lands and water use in that area? Because we normally think of it as a no-no cotton, alfalfa in the desert, you've got to be kidding, get rid of it. But when we're thinking about heat island, and some of the, the issues associated with the expansion in Phoenix, it's not so clear cut that getting rid of that agricultural land is, is necessarily the best way forward, particularly given certain uncertainties. We don't know what's going to happen with Colorado. We don't know where we're going to, what kind of, having agriculture that, for example, San Diego, I think you move agriculture in and out of water use during, it's controversial, it's contentious, but at least it's providing some flexibility when water resources get tough. Agriculture can be paid not to, not to produce. And so how do, we, how do we deal with these types of circumstances? I think um, you know, if agriculture wants to become a player, what kind of modifications are they going to have to deal with and recognize that while they may not personally experience climatic threats, it's threatening the system on which they depend. Um, and therefore, they have a role to play. What kind of governance arrangements will facilitate that positive contribution if it's considered by local users to be something that would be a positive way of dealing with potential uncertainty. So these are the kinds of things that we're trying to explore, but I think it, it fits in that domain. I have a, just a, a, a couple of remarks. One is I really like the fact that Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, so literary imagination, yeah. is what helps make visible the, the, the character of this storm and it sort of highlights maybe the value of multiple kinds of imaginations in, you know, broadening uh, uh, some kind of resilience to, to climate change, right? So it's actually really helpful that we have this range of imagination. So, you know, also that's just what you might say is the value of literature, right? <coughs> but I have a, a different point about imagination, which is that uh, when we think about development, we're sort of assuming, we're imagining a state or an institution that could actually carry out development initiatives. And I think we need to sort of Rather than focusing only on adaptation or what happens in local places, we need to turn our gaze also to how is it that we imagine institutions that are supposed to make all of this happen and take place. Uh, so um, to, to give a Mexican example, some people in Mexico think of the state as being uh, sometimes malevolent and dangerous. Uh, so you know, uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, it depends on who you are. But that is, is a critical factor in how they take up state subsidies, who get state subsidies, whether you believe the government. And, and this could be applied to many other places also. So when we think about climate change and development, we also need to flip our gaze and focus the other way on whether institutions are stable, what are they, who believes in them, how long do they believe in them, how long do they last, how long do policies last. And, and they're much more chaotic than um, people uh, often think. <laughs> to get at in terms of this kind of trajectory, longer historical trajectory, where we may have all the best ideas, but in, or we think we do, <laughs> in a moment of time, although they're always myopic by where we are in any particular moment. But it's also confined by where we've been. And those ideas, identity is another issue that's become really an issue, uh, concern. How does, how we identify ourselves, whether it's as a Francino or as a, you know, we constrain what kinds of things we're willing to consider or types of engagements or relationships we're willing to enter into. Um, and I think these are increasingly subject of adaptation research of trying to think of what are the limits. We, we assume everything is possible, perhaps. You know, if we can just get the right, you know, everything down, we'll figure it out. There must be the, the idea. But increasingly,
increasingly, these are constraints that, uh, you know, are these, I don't know if people here are familiar with Nadine Marshall's work in uh, Australia, where she's finding that the strong identity of, you know, most of my examples are agricultural, I'm sorry, but, but of, of farmers as producers as farmers constrains their ability to move in an unprecedented, uh, changing environment. Um, and I think the same could apply in terms of your relationship or expectations of particular actors. What kinds of things are you willing to engage in? And in, in the Arizona case, the history of that, all that negotiation of water rights means that no one wants to touch it. No one wants to open it up again. It's a very contentious political issue. It was considered resolved and very successfully resolved, and that's the narrative. This is the most successful water resource management in the West. We have this brilliant uh, groundwater management case that is exemplary in the region, um, and it has allowed for effective risk management. Um, so it's been celebrated, but it limits to how much we're willing to even grapple with, with changes now. So I don't know if that kind of gets us, but I think it's... I thought I might ask one question, and then we'll take a break and bill about it talk about this amongst ourselves, and it was related to your agenda, the first point, it was, it was the identification of thresholds at which positive feedback is occurring, fortunately I can read it right here, uh, between generic and specific capacities, and I was trying to imagine in my mind an example of something like that, because I usually talk, we're all concerned about thresholds most recently, I think, in all of our work, I usually focus on the negative thresholds, you know, thresholds where we start running into negative feedback loops. Um, how would we uh, conceive of something like that? Well, this, this is the subject of our current research in Northeast Brazil with Don and Maria Carmen, um, where they are particularly looking at the development of um, policies of the last decade in that region and to what extent it is altering how people per are perceived and are able to manage risk. So the idea, I mean, the nice thing there is that they have an established uh, uh, representative household surveys going back to 1997 at periodic intervals, so we have a, a, a really great panel data that we can look at to see these interventions, kind of an artificial experiment to see how these interventions have changed the way, obviously no drought is the same, the social context are changing, which makes it much more complicated to, to look at, but the idea is, is there something that we can identify in terms of how the resources, the entitlements that households have access to, these elements of generic capacity, have actually altered the way they are managing among the household some kind of level at which we suddenly see a different way of managing environmental risk. Um, obviously, it's very tricky to actually, because of the messiness of the data, um, to be able to do this. So I think this is where, and potentially there may be negative interactions. It's, but there are, I think, issues where you can say, you know, is it because of this political capital that Siri Erickson talks about? Is that suddenly, uh, you know, are finding communities that have through some charismatic factor or some um, change in, you know, a, a new window of opportunity, an ethnic, perhaps, a change in, in, in politics in which there's a, a window up to a different scale. Does that change the way local risk management uh, capacity suddenly can influence the, uh, have an impact on generic uh, capacity building in a particular place? And I think we can imagine these kinds of, of circumstances I think it's very, it would be very difficult to build a kind of coherent theory that says, you know, these are the specific, because I think it'll be very geographically um, particular uh, and very contextual. But it, it may be more useful than thinking a certain type of investment imposed or designed in an international agency will necessarily result in a better state if we don't understand what those potential mechanisms are. Um, and personally, just as a kind of aside, I think um, a lot of the work on adaptation is probably not the case for all of you who are uh, grad students today. But when I was a graduate student, the focus was really on assets that people have. The idea is if you have more assets, if you're able to you know, have more control over your resource base, you're going to be able to adapt more. And I think now, to me, the issues that are more critical are these issues of social capital, political capital, the ties to others and the ties to institutions, the ties to those policy processes that are far more instrumental capacity than, than actually what you own or, or can uh, command in a moment in time. Well, let's leave it at that. Let's, take, let's thank Allie for 